Hi all, in this video we are going to see about the drugs acting on neuromuscular junction. So this question is usually asked as a sub question of an essay question. Like for example if my senior gravis is the uh, essay question, usually one of the sub questions would be the drugs acting on neuromuscular junction. And this can also be asked uh, per se as a short essay. So let's see about this from a physiology point of view. So we know that this is a neuromuscular junction. So based on the site of action or the mechanism of action of these drugs, we can classify them into drugs causing presynaptic blockade, postsynaptic blockade and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So basically acetylcholinesterase is in the synaptic cleft. So that is why we are classifying it separately. So now we will see each one by one. First one is the presynaptic blockade which means the drug is going to act on the presynaptic neuron. So the mechanism is quite simple. They affect the synthesis, storage or release of acetylcholine. So that no acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft, no depolarization of the muscle. So naturally no muscle contraction. So there are drugs that can uh, reduce either synthesis or storage or release. So we will see a few examples. So first one is hemicholinium. So hemicholinium is a drug which acts by blocking the choline uptake. See for manufacture of acetylcholine we need choline. So this hemicholinium will act on this choline transport or inhibit this choline transporter so that the choline uptake does not occur. So naturally acetylcholine will not be able to be synthesized and thus there will be no end plate uh, potential and no action potential of the muscle. So that, that is how hemicholinium acts by acts to reduce acetylcholine synthesis. The next drug that is, uh, that is uh, usually seen to act on the presynaptic neuron is the botulinum toxin. Actually this is a toxin which is released by a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. It is called Clostridium botulinum. So this Clostridium botulinum produces a toxin called botulinum toxin which can cause flaccid paralysis. How? Because they block the calcium dependent vesicle fusion in the presynaptic terminal. So they, they will not allow the release of acetylcholine. See for release of acetylcholine from the vesicles, the vesicle has to fuse with the presynaptic membrane. So that does not occur. So naturally acetylcholine is not released, no end plate potential and this can lead to paralysis. So this, this phenomenon, this uh, condition is called botulism. But botulinum toxin has got another use. It is used in cosmetic treatment like Botox, uh, then strabismus, ecclesia cardia, blepharospasm, cervical dystonia. In all these conditions, there is a spasm of the muscle. And for cosmetic treatments, we want the muscle to be uh, relaxed. So that is why whenever the muscle is tense or in, when it is in a spasm, we use minute amount of botulinum toxin so that that muscle can be paralyzed or that action of the muscle can be reduced. So that is a that is one clinical application of this botulinum toxin. So these were two examples for presynaptic blockade. One was hemicholinium and the other one was botulinum toxin. Next we will move on to the postsynaptic blockade. So in postsynaptic blockade the drug is usually targeting the acetylcholine receptors. See we know that the acetylcholine that is released must act on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So that receptors are affected by these drugs. So based on the mechanism on which they act, we can classify them into competitive or non-depolarizing blockers as well as depolarizing blockers. So we'll see more about them. First we'll see about the competitive non or non-depolarizing blockers. So see, Suppose this is the normal neuromuscular junction. We know that the acetylcholine, normally what happens is the acetylcholine released would bind down to its sites on the nicotinic receptor. So what happens is this channel would open and there would be an entry of sodium. Now here in competitive blockers what they do is they compete with acetylcholine and bind down to these receptors where acetylcholine is supposed to bind. So now what happens? Acetylcholine cannot bind to its receptor. Now the problem is these uh, competitive blockers, they just bind to the side. They don't have any biological activity. So they won't cause influx of sodium. See here, 
that should be influx of sodium to further activate these voltage gated sodium channels so that won't occur they will just occupy the seat where acetylcholine was supposed to bind um, and they have no biological activity so no sodium entry no depolarization that is why we call it as non depolarizing blockers okay so now we'll see some examples samples they are curare and galamine so curare and galamine are two examples of competitive or non depolarizing blockers so what is the mechanism of action they bind to the acetylcholine receptor but do not activate the receptor so acetylcholine cannot bind there is no opening of sodium channels hence no uh, end plate potential no action potential there will be flaccid paralysis and the acetylcholine will remain unable to bind because the receptor is occupied so this is the mechanism of competitive or non depolarizing blockers so what about the other class of drugs the depolarizing blockers here just like our uh, competitive blockers they bind on to the acetylcholine binding sites but here the difference is these uh, blockers have got intrinsic biological activity which means they can cause entry of sodium channel just like acetylcholine would do so then what's the problem the problem is first of all these uh, these drugs that is the depolarizing blockers cannot be degraded by our acetylcholine esterase see normally what happens once the acetylcholine uh, binds on to the receptor it will be quickly deactivated by the acetylcholine esterase but here for depolarizing blockers what happens is once they bind to the receptor it will not be uh, deactivated by the acetylcholine esterase so what happens they will continuously bind to the receptor they will continuously cause entry of sodium so what happens there will be activation of the voltage gated sodium channels but remember voltage gated sodium channels have got an activation and inactivation gate so after 0.5 milliseconds the inactivation gate would be closed so thus what happens after some time there would not be any depolarization the muscle membrane would be in a refractory phase so that is why when depolarizing blockers are given initially there might be some fasciculations because of this initial depolarization of the muscle membrane but soon after that the muscle membrane is refractory phase so there will be flaccid paralysis so that is a mechanism of depolarizing blockers so a good example for depolarizing blockers are succinylcholine so they mimic the action of acetylcholine they bind to acetylcholine receptor and open the ion channels and cause depolarization but they are not hydrolyzed by acetylcholine esterase so they remain attached that is why they cause continuous stimulation of uh, this uh, voltage gated sodium channels and cause continuous depolarization but then they will quickly be inactivated so there will not be any further action potential and thus they cause flaccid paralysis so that is how the post synaptic uh, blocker that is depolarizing blockers will cause paralysis moving on to a third class of drugs which are called the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor so from the name itself we can understand that they basically inhibit this enzyme acetylcholine esterase so what happens whatever acetylcholine is, that is released they will continue to act on these uh, they will continue to bind on to their receptor and continue to activate the sodium channels okay so because there is continuous activation of the voltage gated sodium channel what will happen is after some time there will be inactivation of the sodium channel and the muscle membrane would go into a refractory phase just like we discussed previously so this is how the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor would act so we base there is a subtle difference between the actions of different inhibitors so we can classify them into reversible acetylcholine inhibitors as well as irreversible acetylcholine inhibitors both these inhibitors they basically inhibit acetylcholine esterase so that there is increased accumulation of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft so we'll see each one by one first one is the reversible acetylcholine inhibitors and a good example of that is neostigmine and physiostigmine so if this um, neostigmine is a drug that causes paralysis why should it be given as an injection let's see see we said that the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor they basically compete with acetylcholine and bind on to acetylcholine esterase so acetylcholine is not broken down it will accumulate it will prolong the stimulation of these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors now the good thing is see there are conditions like myasthenia gravis here the problem is there are not much acetylcholine receptors so to enhance transmission actually this can be given because 
at least this is a reversible ester alkylase inhibitor so for some time they can block these ester alkylase so that the ester alkylase can accumulate and bind on to whatever receptors that are present that is why we saw the image of this uh, neostigmine being given as an injection especially in cases of conditions like myasthenia gravis but remember if there is prolonged uh, uh, dosage or prolonged uh, doses given then it can cause a depolarizing block okay so it has got two sides in a, in a particular dosages it can be useful especially in conditions like myasthenia gravis otherwise it will cause a depolarizing block what about the next one irreversible acetylcholine inhibitors now that is a bad thing once it binds to the acetylcholine esterase it is not going to leave it okay so example of that are organophosphates you might have heard of organophosphate poisoning organophosphates are usually seen in pesticides and insecticides and the mechanism of action of this poison is by creating a depolarizing block so what it does is it binds very tightly and irreversibly to this acetylcholine esterase so acetylcholine cannot be broken down it accumulates massively there will be sustained depolarization flaccid paralysis so not only that it overstimulates the muscarinic receptors that is why in such uh, patients we see excessive salivation bradycardia and all so what what can we do is there a, a treatment for a condition like this we can give antidotes the antidotes are atropin it's a muscarinic receptor antagonist you can drugs that will block the muscarinic receptor or you can also use pralidoxin which reactivates the acetylcholinesterase if used early so that was about the irreversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitor so to sum up we've seen the different classes of uh, drugs that act on the neuromuscular junction drugs causing presynaptic blockade examples are hemicholinum and botulinum toxin drugs causing postsynaptic blockade which we further classified into competitive as well as depolarizing uh, drugs so competitive uh, drugs are examples are curare otherwise called tubercurarin and galamine which we have discussed other two examples are pancuronium and atracurium examples for depolarizing drugs are succinylcholine which we have discussed another example is carbamylcholine then we talked about the third class which is acetylcholinesterase inhibitor which again we talked about the reversible and the irreversible reversible ones are as we discussed neostigmine and physiostigmine another example is idrophonium and irreversible examples are organophosphates which are usually seen in insecticides example parathion malathion and sarin so i hope this uh, video was useful for you thank you